Hello, and welcome back to Containers from the Couch. My name is Nathan Peck, and uh, I'll be your host today for a special segment where we speak with a customer of Elastic Container Service and, and Fargate to talk about how they're using AWS and how they're using containers. Uh, let me in, well, allow you to introduce yourself. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Arvind Sharma. I work for a platform team in Bill. Bill is basically a fintech company. My team is basically responsible for scaling and evolving our application using the latest and greatest technologies we have in the market. I'm okay, gonna... and, what, and let me ask, uh, Bill.com, uh, what type of application is this for those who, who aren't uh, familiar? It's, a, it's basically a Java-based application, but you know we, we have a bunch of other applications also like you know, we, as we are building more and more microservices. Okay. And, yeah. uh, and uh, so Bill, uh, the category of business that you deal in, and I assume based on the name, is clearly billing. Uh, yeah. I know in the past when I was a contractor before I worked for AWS, I actually was paid through bill.com. So I, oh. I have a personal relationship <laughs> with the company. I remember it as being something that was very convenient for me when I was a uh, contract worker. Uh, so I know I've, I've actually received a paycheck through bill.com. Tell us a little bit more about like the size and scale and scope of, uh, of your company. Yeah. So, uh, you know, bill.com, as I'm telling you, like it's an old company. It's like 16 year old company. And I'm with a bill from last three years, which is an amazing journey so far. And we grew super exponentially over the last uh, few years. Just to give you some numbers, you know, as of last physical year, which ended on June 30th, 2022, we had more than 400,000 customers who uses our solution. We had like more than uh, 4.7 million customers or members who get paid or pay using our platform. Our last year physical revenue was more than six, it's close to $642 million. Our platform moved uh, around $225 billion during last uh, physical year. Just to give you a perspective, it's like close to a billion dollar per working day. And we processed more than 38 million transactions in uh, last physical year. So you can see like, you know, the size, you know, the company is growing really rapidly over the last few years. And there's a lot of potential we have ahead of us. Okay, so that's a ton of growth. Yeah. And I imagine based on the amount of growth that cloud has been a pivotal part of that journey to making that growth possible. So tell us a little bit about Bill.com, you know, how, how your journey to the cloud went, where you are and where you're going. Yep. So Bill.com is basically a, you know, cell-based architecture, which allow us to segment our customer and their data to, and compute to one cell. Okay. Uh, so let me interrupt here and ask you, uh, because, you know, some of the people who are, who are watching the show, they may not be particularly familiar with the cell-based architecture. You know, yeah. What is a cell-based architecture? What does that, that do for uh, you as like a user or even a developer of this architecture? Yeah. So cell-based architecture is just, you know, where we can actually, you know, uh, have our customer, you know, segment our customers uh, to a given, uh, given location where, you know, based on uh, their data as well as to compute. It helps us to, allow, you know, expand our business needs as we move forward. And this is also very important because, you know, we, if we have a customer from uh, U.S. or versus in Canada or U.K. and they have a different regulations and requirement and we have to isolate those things. So with a cell-based architecture, we can actually bring up our data center or our application in a given cell so that it's a more of a rinse and repeat solution. So that's what we uh, have in our uh, build.com. Nice. So that, that makes a lot of sense. When you first out growing a company, maybe you can run everything out of one uh, AWS region in one geographical part of the world. But as things grow larger, it sounds like I need to switch to cellular architecture because now I have customers all over the world and customer data can actually be distributed all over the world too. Yep. Now I understand you have a, a architecture diagram. And, yep. Uh, let's see if we can bring that up on the stream here. Awesome. Yeah. As you can see in, in this given uh, example, we have, we, as you mentioned in the beginning, it was, a, you know, we had only one data center and we were actually hosting the things on on-prem, right? And then we have a disaster recovery data center and everything was basically structured in a cell-based architecture, right? And things were working fine. And back in like uh, 2020, our CTO, Vinay Pai, sponsored this project to introduce a second cell because of our growth, you know, because we were actually scaling uh, vertically and it's time for us to start uh, scaling up horizontally so that you know, it gives, a, give us, gives us a better redundancy and high availability. So originally we put our, this particular, uh, uh, you know, cell-based architecture application in our AWS using EC2, but the recent uh, uh, 
recent work which we done for this one is just basically replatform the using this easiest Fargate. Nice. Yeah. So the the classic question that always pops up around this time is, okay, ECS Fargate, why did you choose containers, you know, over just plain EC2? And you know, what were the benefits of containers for your architecture? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Uh, so containers have been um, made it much easier to launch a new cell in AWS because, as I mentioned, like you know, Bill is basically cell based architecture, and you know that's a really very container was a very important uh, tool to make this cell based architecture rinse and repeat pretty quickly. You know, we we are just starting with our international expansion and leveraging AWS and containers has been a key enabler for that business growth. Due to which we were able to you know, uh, launch new cells in uh, Canada and UK in no time. Bill started its, uh, uh, its our uh, container journey back in 2018, where we already had a few microservices which are already containerized and uh, deployed in AWS ECS EC2. Recent changes in our, uh, was basically meant for our core application, which is basically you can call it as a, a backbone or brain of our application. And which need, you know, because of the growing needs, we need a more agility to our application. With containers, we could scale up and down in minutes according to our traffic patterns. So, if there is any spike in the traffic, we can scale up in minutes. And we know if during the late evening hours when we don't have a lot of traffic, we can scale down, which helped us a whole lot with our cost optimization, where we don't need a static farm uh, running twenty four seven, and the things can scale up and down based on our traffic demand. Yeah, I've seen that same story time and time again. Like people just appreciate the fact that a container will start up on an EC2 instance yeah. faster than trying to spin up a whole new EC2 instance, you know, from scratch, basically. Yes. And and because you're able to share that pool of EC2 instances, then different services uh, can change, you know, within the balance of that uh, that cluster uh, over time. So. I, I totally understand containers there. Tell me a little about ECS, the choice of ECS and Fargate. Uh, why did you choose those in particular? And, and what were the benefits of, of those choices? Yeah. So our ECS journey, uh, ECS Fargate journey is seamless. It was very, very easy to build and deploy in ECS Fargate. So we were already in an ECS EC2 and familiar with ECS back in the days. We ECS was positioned by AWS as having a powerful simplicity. And that has been largely true in our experience. With the ECS Fargate, you know, dev team can spin up uh, their cluster and services without having to know a ton of uh, about container orchestration because dev really want to just focus on writing the code, building an uh, application, and get it to production. So ECS Fargate provides us that flexibility that developer doesn't need to know the whole container orchestration layer. And Fargate was the next logical step for us as we were already on the ECS EC2. And getting to the ECS Fargate provided us a flexibility where we don't have to run the uh, we, where we don't have to learn everything about the container orchestration. Being Fargate is a serverless. It helped us a lot with the unexpected uh, traffic spike as as I mentioned earlier. It can scale up and down in no time. Okay, now I understand uh, that you're you're talking about scaling, and uh, let's bring up a diagram of the actual uh, scaling in, in action here. You're saying you have a diagram? Yep, I do have. I just want to show you the perspective of how well it worked out for us. There we go. That's a beautiful, beautiful graph. So what are we seeing here? So we are seeing, uh, seeing the scaling of our uh, you know, task or you know, in, in a simple layman uh, language, is we are seeing the number of our containers or uh, machines running at any given time of uh, the day. So you can see like you now, during the, you know, when we had the traffic started, you know, in the you know, early in the morning or during the first half of the day, the traffic was pretty uh, less. So that, you know, the number of containers running is comparatively less. And as the time progressed, you know, we have a more customer started using our application and all those things. You can see this, there's a spike, there's an increase in number of uh, tasks. So they keep this, uh, scaling up and all the way to like, you know, till the end of the day. As you see, like, you know, we hit the a peak around, uh, late evening and after that things start going down right so it's mostly it's basically like uh, auto scale up and down based on the load and our auto scaling is uh, tied up to the cpu uh, load right so as and when we have a more traffic our cpu uh, usage increase and it actually increases the you know scale up our containers so you can actually see like this is this is exactly what we see every day you know in the uh, in the morning times or you know, we have a very minimal number of containers or uh, uh, running for our application. 
and throughout the day it keeps going up and by the end of the day it comes down that sounds like the perfect application for scaling because it makes sense that you know a lot of the billing is going to happen during business hours you know a lot of paychecks being sent a lot of bills being you know sent or, or received or paid so this is the perfect type of application that's going to have a daily curve to it now I, let me ask you know with regard to the scaling uh, did you have specific targets you were trying to hit, um, you know, maybe savings in terms of, of, of money being spent on infrastructure or something like that? And were you able to hit those targets? Well, you know, what was the results? Yeah, I think you know, in, in general, I think we had a really good success with the EC, uh, ECS Fargate. But just to give you a little bit more context behind that thing, you know, back mm -hmm. in the days, our legacy EC2 compute, uh, you know, before we migrated to ECS Fargate, our legacy EC2 compute were optimized for peak load, where we had like, you know, the maximum whatever we need maximum is being uh, provisioned and up and running, which was not a very efficient way of running the things. Rather than investing in an EC2 platform, we elected the ECS uh, since container were aligned with our strategic direction for our net new development, right? So now that we are on the ECS Fargate, we got an auto scaling, auto healing, and a benefit of immutable infrastructure. We also had a ton of customer a deployment script because because we we were using a different kind of orchestration tool and all those things which were very cumbersome but with this thing we were able to replace that with the aws deployment language right it really helped us with uh, our business growth and as you were asking about about some numbers you know being uh, ecs fargate is serverless it reduces our operational cost you know we don't have to maintain that uh, infrastructure by uh, you know the patching or a security updates or whatever and I think that just to give us uh, some numbers uh, around this one, moving to AWS ECS Fargate gave us an 80% saving in our lower environment and 30% in our production. And it's all because of auto scaling and spot instances. Having a spot instance with auto scaling, it's really, 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 very, uh, you know, cost, cost efficient. If your application is not very much, it, it can fail and, you know, heal up, heal back uh, without any disruption. You know, spot instance is a really good way of, uh, you know, putting that application. So we are using most of the, most of our lower environment are running on spot instance because those are our internal environment. They are not as critical as production. That's why we were able to get to 80% of the cost saving. Most wow. So that makes sense. I imagine a lot of the workload of actually processing the bills is asynchronous then. So you can have a synchronous uh, portion, which is, which is, you know, customer facing like API or, or website that has to be up and running constantly. But the back end portion could be on spot because even if a spot task gets gets killed or, or goes down, yeah. it gets replaced. It's not the end of the world. You know, that that, that bill might be process delayed by a second or two. Right. But it'll be picked up by some other worker. That's exactly. And that's very because most of the thing, as you mentioned, they are asynchronous. Everything is uh, picked up from the queue. So even if the spot instance die, it dies in the middle, it doesn't hurt us because other instance will pick it up. And as you mentioned, we need a like you know, a bit, just to set the bare minimal like this is what we want on the non-spot instance, right? And all other on the spot instance which can orchestrate. And for lower environment because it's all internal, right? If you have a two minimum, uh, even the you know I'm talking about the app side, the front end thing. If you have a uh, like two minimum running. Uh, as a minimum count, right? And you let it run. And even if the spot instance claim it back, you have the another spot instance available for you. So you don't see actually downtime for your application. So that helped us a whole lot in our lower environment. And as I mentioned, we saved more than 80% for our lower environment because back in the days, as I mentioned, we had our, we were, uh, we were, uh, you know, we were optimized for peak load. So we had like 24 seven static farm running versus now we have auto scaling with the, spot instances on our lower environment and for our production we are actually a little bit you know being with fintech and all those things we are a little bit selective whether where to use a spot instance in production or, or where we should not be using because there are some critical payment jobs and we do not want to run them on a spot instance because that could lead some kind of a, you know because if there's a critical job running and it dies in the middle it can cause some you know unknown issues so that, that's where we are still uh, trying to get you know familiar or just trying building our confidence on the top of it before we actually migrate them to the spot instances wow well so i gotta ask you know obviously this sounds pretty magical sounds like everything's working great auto scaling spot instances causing huge savings but everybody i know that every journey is not without you know challenges along the way you know obviously 
any any big change like this, moving from on-prem into the cloud, moving to containers, moving to scaling, there must have been some challenges on the way. So can you tell us like a story about challenges you face along the way and, and how you solve them? Because I find that a lot of times our viewers love those stories the most. You know, what were the problems that you had to solve and how did you end up solving them? No, th that's a great question, you know. So again, you know, uh, mostly we had an amazing journey. I think it was pretty much easy, you know, it, as I mentioned, like it's, it's, you don't have to learn a whole lot of about the orchestration and also the ECS Fargate actually provides you very layman uh, kind of terms like where any developer can get a grasp of those things and get it going, right? So it was very easy. But as you mentioned, there are, there are always some challenges and that's how we all learn and evolve. So we also, like any other company, we also had a few challenges. Well, our first challenge was like, you know, integrating our Fluent Bit image for our logging purpose. So we were, you know, back in the days, we were using a Splunk forwarder in our uh, containers to send the logs. But, you know, with this new uh, replatforming, we want to use a, a Fluent Bit. It worked out really good. The initial integration was super easy, but, at, you know, because of the high volume of uh, our application, you know, if we need to fine tune or we need to uh, do some adjustment on the fluent bit, and that was a little bit challenging for us. Also, being ECS Fargate is a serverless. You cannot pick and choose the instance type what you need, because of which you get a lot of variation on your underlying hardware, and because of which you get a different throughput from each instance type, and which was giving us a little bit of a. a uh, uh, in the beginning, we were having a little bit of trouble with the auto scaling because you know if you have a underperforming instance and if you have a the auto scaling was not working as expected so then we changed it to lor which is a least outstanding request from the round robin on the alb which helped us to solve this varying performance across the tasks so I okay so so some viewers may not be familiar with those two algorithms do so i could provide a little more context on that obviously the alb is is responsible for distributing traffic to the containers on the back end. And my understanding is round robin is basically just uh, container by container distributing, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, assuming yep. you're running three tasks, you know, it distributes the traffic evenly. Yep. But as you scale up, that doesn't necessarily work anymore because you added a new container and it's receiving one, two, three, but the load balancer is actually still uh, sending some requests to the old overburdened tasks. Yeah. So the solution to that is least outstanding requests uh, policy there, which says the load balancer looks and says, I see that this new task doesn't have any connections yet, whereas this old task has a bunch. So yeah. instead, I'm going to send most of the traffic to this new uh, task until it fills up with connections. So you get a little bit more even distribution as opposed to just purely round robin, you know, one by one distributing those those connections. Yeah, I, I would say like that was one of our really uh, good learning because we find out in the beginning because, you know, because of this thing, we were seeing a, some tasks performing a little slow because of the, you know, underlying hardware. It has nothing to do with the application mm -hmm. or whatever. But changing this actually helped us a whole lot and we were getting a pretty consistent uh, performance and throughput for our application. That's a fantastic tip because I find a lot of people, they don't know about that that setting. And then when they discover it, they're like, whoa, this was a game changer. <laughs> yes, that's right. It was indeed a game changer for us. And another thing, as I mentioned, that we re with this project, we replatform our mature core application to the container, which was also being challenging. You know, when you have a, a you know, uh, you know, uh, your mature uh, core application, you know, and which is basically the backbone of your uh, whole system. That was also being a little bit challenging because we want to get right at the first place, but you know because but because of that thing you know because of this same reason you know the size of our image was you know was a little bit bigger than what it should be in an ideal container world right, so you know we know some we we have some gaps we are and we are continue working on that one and trying to reduce our image size. And because of this bigger image size, and as of now, ECS Fargate uh, doesn't have an image caching. I know there's a work in progress, and I've, I, I heard sometime later this year we'll have that thing. But you know, because right now we don't have that thing, we have we have we have a little bit higher boot up time because you know all the time we have to pull the image from the ECR. So our boot up time for our tasks was a little bit longer. But you know, we. We adjusted that within our uh, auto scaling. We start. We sc we are scaling up a little bit ahead of time so that you know we don't you know we can count in you know, account for that extra minute or whatever we need to uh, whatever the extra minute is taking to you know bring up the new container. 
that's 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 good advice as well. Yeah. Um, so a lot of a lot of challenges there, and you found, and I, I like these workarounds that, that you found. Do you have any any final uh, words of advice uh, for folks who are also looking to build with containers on AWS? I I would definitely encourage uh, everyone to gig, look into this ECS Fargate. You know, ECS Fargate is a worth the investment. If you are not on any co container orchestration and this is your first time, I would highly encourage you that it is, as I mentioned just now, it's a worth the investment, right? It is not. It is basically a one-time uh, uh, effort to build uh, the blueprint, and after it's a rinse and repeat solution for all the services, whatever you build, and that's what we did with our application. And also, you know, another thing which I, which we were doing in the beginning, that we were trying to overcomplicate our uh, uh, auto scaling with a lot of metrics. Hey, we want to auto scale based on memory because we want to auto scale based on CPU number of requests. Don't do that thing. <laughs> stick to one. Uh, stick to one or two. I would personally recommend uh, stick to one because that's how we were originally. We were actually having a like, you know, we came up with like two or three different metrics using which we want to scale up and down, and. You know, I believe we we are we learned a whole lot that we want to keep it simple, and it is working really, 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 really amazing for us. And another point I would say, like if if AWS is your uh, strategy provider going forward, and if you don't have any existing in-house Kubernetes experts, take a closer look at the ECS, especially ECS Fargate. You know, it's very easy to use. If you can actually get it going in no time. Also, you know, you know, as we have auto scaling, you know. You might have some kind of bad jobs which runs at a given time, and you know if they start running, you know the auto scaling might will take a couple of minutes. So, if you have some bad jobs, you know what when it's gonna run or what are the time it's gonna run. Use the time based auto scaling because you, see, uh, you can actually scale up ahead of time so that you are ready for your bad job. And now the another the important other thing if you are actually if it if this is going to be a migration project where you want to actually migrate your existing application from EC2 to container, use the slow rollout strategy using target weight group, because that helped us whole a lot, you know, because we, this was our migration project where we want to re-platform from EC2 to ECS. We use the target weight group where we, actually, we were able to roll out the application uh, with us in a slow percentage rollout. So in the beginning, we started with the 5%. We looked into, looked into traffic pattern. We make sure everything is working. Then we warmed up to 10%. Then, you know, go from all the way to 100%. So that gives us a whole lot of confidence throughout this journey. That's that's great advice. Uh, just running another two two copies of the stack here, especially if you're not quite sure where those auto-scaling rules are set up perfectly yeah. from the beginning, you can gradually shift that traffic over to load balancer. Customers don't even know this. <laughs> but yeah. you see that traffic grip, uh, gradually shifting over, and then you build that confidence and say, this new stack is ready to go. <laughs> yep. And also, you know, just use or put your old metrics like data or whatever the metrics tools you have internally. Just keep monitoring your errors, addex score, or whatever. That will give you confidence whether how the, your new platform is working compared to the old one, which can help you to make a quick decisions during the rollout. Well, thank you so much uh, for your words of wisdom today um, about how to adopt containers, adopt ECS, some of the settings that y'all were able to use. Uh, to achieve tremendous scale at build.com uh, on the ECS platform. So thank you very much uh, for joining today and, uh, and sharing that wisdom with us. Thank you, Nathan, for having me on this uh, container on the couch. I think it, it was really great talking to you. And I hope, you know, people will definitely give a shot to the ECS Fargate because trust me, it's a, it's a simple, you know, in the beginning, I was also a little bit overwhelmed, but as I started using, it was really very easy to learn and get it going. Thank you very much. All right. And we'll talk to you later. All right, Nathan. Good talking Thank to you. you.